So welcome everyone. I apologize for being a couple minutes late and kicking this off, but it is my uh, great honor to be here today with Colonel Ingrid Gerdje. Uh, I thought my Norwegian is not what my grandparents would hope and uh, limited to Norwegian food mostly. Um, if people try to give you Ludfisk, don't take it. Rumagrit, Lefse, that stuff's pretty good, but avoid the Ludfisk if you can. My personal advice, but you probably feel differently. Anyway, um, really terrific to have her here with us today. She's an extremely accomplished woman and combat leader at multiple levels in many different environments, Lebanon, Kosovo, uh, most recently led Norwegian forces in Afghanistan. Um, she's, I believe, about to assume command of essentially their National Defense University, the first female to do that. Um, and we particularly were interested in having her because uh, I think she can really help us better understand some of the challenges that we are about to undertake in more broadly integrating women specifically into the combat arms, which is something the Norwegians have been doing for a couple of decades uh, or more. And, and so they have addressed, albeit at a very different scale, um, some of the challenges that, that we are about to undertake. And so um, we thought that it would be a great opportunity to have her uh, talk to us about some of the experiences that they have had and that she herself has had um, to help that inform, inform that debate and that uh, evolution here at home. Uh, and also, I think, for us to better understand some of the differences um, and where we might not be able to straight line extrapolate from, um, from what Norway has done <clears throat> into our culture. So again, greatly honored to have you and so uh, happy that you took the time. We ran her around the Pentagon uh, yesterday where she had lots of meetings with folks who are trying to deal with that issue uh, in the services and in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So uh, we put her through one ringer and she is back again this morning for more. So um, again, grateful and, and really looking forward to the conversation. So we want to make a couple of remarks and then we'll uh, open it up to the audience for a broader discussion. your mic, sorry. I bothered. <coughs> yeah, this is better, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Yeah, I think the, the, the main arguments for increasing the number and, and also having female in, in the combat positions is that we, we can't afford recruiting from only half of the population. We need the best brains and the best bodies for, for this work uh, and therefore we need to recruit from women as well. We also think diversity is important for an organiza organization to succeed and women contribute to this diversity. Uh, to, to have a more innovative culture where you see issues from different angels. And also the last issue is that some of the tasks we, or many of the tasks we do as units, um, uh, we, we can't handle them without having women in the units. I can talk about information gathering, mm -hmm building trust among, among a local population where half are, are women or children, and, uh, and also practical issues like searching women or, uh, or uh, house searching and such things. And I was the young platoon commander in Lebanon. I was the only one in the platoon, and we were told never to search women. And, I, and that was special because we knew that women were also smuggling weapons and explosives, which meant our unit didn't do our job because we lacked uh, the women to search. Personally, I've been in the infantry for, for more than 20 years. And uh, with very few exceptions, I have felt like that my comrades, my, uh, my leaders, and my troops have appreciated me as um, as a soldiers for the job I've done, and for the dedication for my service and for my country. And my experience with uh, women in combat positions is that they are in general regarded as part of the unit, similar to their male colleagues. Um, I, I can't think of a single issue where I wasn't able to do my job due to my gender. And I'm very often asked about this, working in Lebanon or in Afghanistan, negotiating with the local leaders and so on. Would they trust, would they, uh, would they accept negotiating with a female commander? And that, that has not been an issue. Because I, I, I don't like to compare myself with Madeleine Albright or Hillary Clinton or these women. But you see, women representing their country or their unit are not regarded as the local women. They are regarded as women with power. We represent military power or economic power or other kinds of power, which means the elderly in Afghanistan uh, would meet me, and, and I felt I was treated like another officer. Uh, of course, with respect in the way you, you greet each other and so on. And I've seen that with other women. And, um, and I, I think I've seen numerous examples where my sister in, in arms do come closer to the local population due to our gender or, or the sex. Uh, because you can talk to, to local women. So, um, so that's part of it. I guess you also have heard lots of myths, what I call myths about women. For instance, that women change the morale in the units, which means that if we are in a tough situation, our male comrade in arms will be so focused on caring for their female uh, troops or comrades. And I've, I've never seen this myself. They'll throw you under the bus. Hmm? They'll throw you under the bus. Yes. <laughs> no, I no. haven't seen anything of it. I think as military, we are so focused at we're, as we are operating that the focus is doing the job. Right. And of course, we take care of each other. But, but I can't see that there is a big difference between uh, men and women in, in that manner. The last thing I will mention is, uh, b before we go to questions and answers there, is the concerns about the physical abilities of women. And I have to underline the fact that there, there are differences. And, uh, and even if we are in 2013 with modern technology, mechanized units, 
being in the infantry or in the combat positions is physically hard. So we have to have requirements which make those who, um, who join the units able to succeed and to do their job. Uh, that's important. I hear some arguments that, well, now it's technology. Uh, the technology doesn't really mean we need uh, physical uh, standards, but, but we absolutely do. So my main mes master message today is that, yes, we can integrate women successfully. The most important thing is leadership uh, to succeed in this. We need uh, leaders who inspire and support both their female and male um, subordinates. We need leaders that are able to build healthy cultures within their units. And finally, we do need leaders who do not tolerate harassment of any kind, also regardless of gender. I do not think there is any reason to fear big crowds of women joining your combat positions or making big changes overnight. And I think we have to deal with lots of myths. But when that said, I, I really wish the US good luck with, uh, with an important job that will take time, namely integrating the women in the combat positions. Um, well, th thank you for those uh, opening thoughts. Uh, there are, I'm sure, lots and lots of questions out here. I want to start with a couple, um, one of which is about the experience that you have had with retaining females, because that's been one of our biggest challenges, even outside the combat arms, um, that female soldiers tend to get out at much higher rates than their male counterparts at, at around uh, eight to ten years. and. Um, and there are a lot of different, there's a lot of research about why that happens, but um, we haven't found a set of policy solutions to try to affect that. I'm wondering how, if you have the same challenge, how you have dealt with it, um, and, and what your experience has been personally in, with respect to that mm. issue. Yeah, we have the same challenge. We have a hard time retaining women. And in particular, in the time where where they give birth mm -hmm. or, or family settles. It's, it's hard to combine career and being a mother or, or part of a family. And, um, and I think it's important that we have flexible systems. At the time we give birth, that's very often uh, when you are a platoon or company commander. It's also very often at the time you take your command and staff college. Uh, and of course deployments. And uh, if you have very set standards when it comes to age for this kind of positions or, um, or education and so on, it, it will be hard. So I think we need, and we work on that back home, to be a little more flexible. Mm -hmm. We also have a very long maternity leave in Norway. One year maternity leave, very often a split between the father and, um, and the mother, uh, w which means it's a little easier to deal with deployments and so on because we know at least we can stay home for at least one year. But again, I, I, we have to organize within every unit and in our system to make sure that there is possible, it is possible to combine these things. And, uh, and I think we have made progress, but we still have a way to, do, to go. And these days, also, our male colleagues are much more um, interested in uh, being part of their family, taking part of raising their children, and so on. So this is not a typical female issue. It's actually a family issue mm -hmm. for military families. Mm -hmm. um, let me also ask about mentoring. Um, one of the things that we're trying to deal with is if you don't have uh, hires, who are females, how do you mentor the new women coming in? Um, and so you were relatively early in women coming into the Norwegian force. Um, so presumably you didn't have a lot of female mentors, at least 
for a while and, and probably not that many ever, I would imagine. Um, what is your thought on how to best provide that mentoring? Um, and can you talk about what mentoring you had that was meaningful given the absence of it, or presumed absence of it? I don't know. Well, we're going back to leadership. Yeah. I think we have to build strong leaders with integrity who are able to handle both male and female subordinates or, or peers. Uh, so that has to be part of their leadership education, how to deal with uh, mentoring uh, both sexes or, or, or other uh, people with different backgrounds. That's part of it. And I have had some very strong leaders who have believed in me and who have supported me, male leaders, and I have felt very confident because I feel they have seen me for what I do and, and not uh, as uh, the woman in, uh, in combat. When that said, I also think there is nobody who can understand my thoughts and, and uh, maybe challenges as good as another female officer. As I didn't have many of the, uh, those who were um, in front of me. Right. Uh, at least I didn't know the few very well. But, uh, but for instance, the little group, we were four women in my military academy as I was a cadet, and we're still very close after more than 20 years because those are the ones who really understand some of the hardship of some of the issues. When that said, it, it hasn't been that tough, but, uh, but, but that means a lot to me. And I think, when, uh, I think it's tougher to be an enlisted mm -hmm. or a younger officer than an experienced officer as mm -hmm. I am, mm -hmm. which means that I think in the units we, we should try to find other role models, um, both, both men but also women, uh, who could be a person they could uh, yeah, use as a mentor or, or get some extra support if there are particular issues dealing with, uh, with gender. Okay. But, but, but we, we shouldn't just point at the other women. This right. is mainly a leadership responsibility, regardless of gender, mm -hmm. to take care of your subordinates. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are there, if there are questions out there, I would love to entertain them. And if not, I'll, I, have, I could talk to you for three or four hours. So um, if people have questions, or I'll keep going. Go ahead, Ray. Uh, yes, here it comes, sorry. If you could uh, state your name and affiliation. Uh, Ray Dubois, CSIS. Uh, Colonel, in the United States Army, we've managed to break the glass ceiling. In fact, the United States Army was the first of our services to have a four-star female general. Uh, Ann Dunwoody, who commanded the Army Material Command. Today we have our Deputy Chief of Staff, G2, Mary Legere, three-star. Um, have, have you broken the glass ceiling in Norway to become a general officer? <laughs> yes, we have, um, you know, we, we are, um, it's a small army and small defense, yeah. but we have a few generals. We have two Navy generals and we have one Army general. Uh, we still do not have anyone with uh, the so-called combat position background, but, but within logistic or administrative, which means they have absolutely broken the glass ceiling. And I think for me and my sister since arms at my level, I do not see any glass ceiling. Uh, if I'm... <laughs> Uh, when I think about my future career, it's a question about my skills and competence, but not my gender. That's my, uh, uh, my impression. Mm. But when that said, we, we have issues. There are women in the Norwegian forces that feel that we have a glass ceiling, and I think it's tougher on particular levels. Mm. And... Um, uh, so, so this is an issue we absolutely work on. When we are competing, there are always discussions whether you are given a position due to your, uh, yeah, uh, what's the reason for being selected or not. Right. right. Uh, there's a question here and then we'll come over here. <coughs> uh, I'm Bill Nahr with Joint Special Operations University. Hello. Uh, Colonel, can you talk about standards? Uh, 
you know, we talk about uh, gender neutral or gender norm, gender norm standards and, and, uh, and how do you deal with standards within, within your service? Yeah, I better be a little careful here because that's a, that's a hot topic back home. And uh, the fact is that we have diverse standard for women, men and women as, we, uh, as the general standards. And there is the discussion whether this should be changed, at in, and it seems like the Navy and the Air Force now will have uh, same standards for everyone, but the Army still will have uh, a difference. Personally, as I mentioned in the very beginning, it's very important for me that the girls we select or um, those who, who come into the uh, Every, every branch actually, not only the combat branch, but that they have the right skills and competences uh, um, for, um, for doing their jobs. Which means that I think it might be the right thing to at least have standards for particular jobs or units. Which means that you make sure that you have kind of the, the baseline. When that said, we have d different standards in general, but when it comes to training, it's exactly the same. So when you go through the courses uh, and all the field training, which really is what shows if you're able to do your job or not, I can run uh, the, the two uh, miler without the problem beating my, many of my male colleagues, but am I able to carry the heavy burden, mm -hmm. the rucksack, uh, the field operations? and and. When it comes to this training, it's exactly the same for men and women. And even in my unit, I've had several, both male and women, who have had no problem with, with the general standards, but we have had to, uh, they haven't been able to uh, continue because they haven't managed the practical uh, job or, or, or the, um, the training <laughs> programs. Okay, um, I have a question about whether, as we are at the at the start of this in uh, in the combat arms, are there things that you think challenges that we don't necessarily think much about right now that we might see emerge in three to five years? That um, uh, I'm thinking in particular about things because of the intense physical nature of combat arms training in particular. Um, we don't have an experience base for what the long-term physical demands of that might result in. So that is something I think could emerge as a challenge down the road, um, mm. hypothetically. But so I'm just wondering if there are things that you can anticipate for us that we may not be able to see very well right now. Mainly when it comes to the physical. Well, not uh, just nece not part. necessarily only physical, but um, cultural or anything else. Or what's what's stage two of this look mm -hmm. like for us in your experience? Oh, I, as I mentioned, I, I don't think there is a big difference between integrating women to combat positions and other positions, which means the U.S. has lots and lots of experience yeah. with women in every branch and really have been into the very toughest situation and, and the risk level uh, uh, in war. So, so, so you really have some, some experience. Um, if I should be concerned, it must be that, uh, that it takes time. Uh, you can't be too impatient in raising the number or, uh, or, or really succeeding. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it takes time to build healthy culture to, to the extent that there is image issues or uh, people who are reluctant to seeing women within their, um, uh, within their unit. Uh, that will be, take time to change, I think. Okay. Because even in Norway, we have had women in since 84. We, we, it's a very egalitarian society, but still we have to have continuous focus on how we deal with, uh, uh, with, with gender perspectives and, um, and leadership. Okay. Sorry, in the back. Thank you very much. Um, one little comment and one question. 
Um, to, yeah, I am Colonel Kebe from, uh, I am the defense attache of the Senegalese embassy. Uh, I congratulate you for the presentation. And uh, the comment, uh, you know, I see one limit uh, in uh, integrating the female in the combat units. Uh, the limit is specifically um, a gender <coughs> uh, problem, uh, mainly uh, during the pregnancy of uh, the women. I think that is something that jeopardizes the participation of uh, uh, the women in the combat units. Mm. That is a main problem. Um, the risk is uh, uh, an emotional level. Uh, during the Vietnam War, the body count was uh, a real problem and had, uh, I think, some implication in the American opinion. And maybe that is what make, uh, it is said that uh, that is what made uh, America lose the war, because always they were counting the dead, the dead. Um, when it happens that a female soldier is killed, mm. I think the emotion is higher. And in, uh, during the war time, I think maybe that will be, uh, uh, that, that will have a negative impact, I mean, in, uh, in the combat in the opinion of the population. But my question uh, is, um, I would like to know how um, you are managing the problem of marriage, marriage between two soldiers in the different categories. Uh, is a soldier allowed to marry an officer or vice versa? Thank you very much. Um, if I can make a quick comment, I, mean, I, I think there's a difference between, uh, we. Many women have lost their lives in the Afghanistan conflict, and, and I think, and, and in Iraq, and I, it's, it's interesting to me that we don't talk about that. I mean, we talk about those who lost their lives, but we don't make a distinction publicly mm -hmm. at any, it doesn't, that distinction doesn't seem to resonate now. So I, I would just offer that as a counterpoint to what might have happened in Vietnam. But mm -hmm. anyway, go ahead. No, and, and that's the same experience I had when we have had wounded, uh, or issues, I, I really can't see the difference uh, in the emotional uh, approach to it, uh, whether it's a woman or a man. But I guess that's also because when you have well-trained units with strong cohesion, uh, you're, you're a comrade or a sister and brother in arms more than, uh, more than a woman or a man out fighting. Uh, and I am also, discussed this with IDF. I, I listened to a psychologist in uh, Israel's, uh, Israeli Defense Force, and I think, and he said that there, it's a myth what is said about the Israeli experience, that they took their women out because uh, it was not good for the morale of, uh, of the, the male um, part of the Jewish forces. Uh, that's at least what he told uh, in my experience. But it might be cultural differences here, and uh, so I, I should be careful about stating something uh, in general. Well, uh, pregnancy, very short, yes. <laughs> Women get pregnant, <laughs> and uh, it's not a big problem in the Norwegian forces, maybe because we are, we are small, and uh, just like one can be sick, or there can be other reasons for uh, being taken out of the unit for a while or not deploying with the unit, we, we handle the pregnant one. In my unit, we will replace them at the time they are not able to do their regular job. And when they are back from their maternity leave, uh, they consider if they continue here or if, if there are other jobs that are more, uh, uh, yeah, it fits them better. So, so that can be handled, I think. When it comes to marriage or relationships between soldiers and officers, we have some policies, of course, just like most nations. Um, within a unit, it's, uh, you, you really have to avoid having couples. But depends on what kind of unit and what level, I think. So, when we have relationships within a platoon or a company, and it happens now and then, then I will talk to those 
um, we're dealing with and, and separate them. We, we, we put one of them into another unit and, and that works quite well. Because uh, as every other organization, you can't avoid having relationships when we stay in for many years. And when it comes to relationships within the, within the line, uh, that's not acceptable. You cannot, as an officer, uh, have a relationship with, with, uh, uh, with a subordinate. But what's important for me, before we had very strict rules when it came to this, and we said it's not legal, do, don't, 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 and there were lots of things going on. Uh, lots of rumors, not lots of issues with this. Now we try to change to a more, uh, that, uh, to, to find good solution for every part of these issues in order to make this an open issue where, you, where uh, the ones in relationships tell their commanders and we deal with it uh, to find the best solution for those involved. Uh, if I could follow on to that, uh that topic briefly and ask about um, dual service couples and how you manage those. I mean, we, I think, have changed our policies fairly significantly over the last 10 to 15 years to really try to better accommodate mm -hmm. dual service couples. Um, it's always a challenge given the scale that we face and particularly when they're in multiple services. But um, how, how did, what's your approach to that? Um, do, you, do you have a lot of them and how do you try to manage that? That issue. We have a number of them, and I'm <laughs> I'm one, one myself. Yes. So I'm married to another officer, and and again, it's a question about finding good solutions for the couple. And I think the Norwegian army and defense in general is good at this. They will always give us uh, the same location for our service. We will make sure that we're not within uh, yeah work too close. But, but it's worked very well for us. And when it comes to deployment, I think we, we can influence very much when we deploy more than many US, uh, US um, officers or, or units, which means that me and my husband wouldn't deploy at the same time. We're in different units and one, one time it's him and, and another one me. And of course, you have to sacrifice a little when you are a military couple. And it's a very good thing to have some good grandparents for the kids to make everything uh, work well. Because it, it is tough yeah. to, to handle career for two. And I know some of, some of you have met my husband in the military academy, my, my house wife last year. And I can really recommend having your husband at home for a year, making dinner, <laughs> taking care of the kids. And, so, so he's really tried that part uh, as well. Great. Mm. Um, when you go into your future position as the uh, commander of the Defense University, do you, I'm, I'm just curious about whether you think your gender will affect how you do that job at all. In, in the sense of, are there, um, it, it, I, I don't think directly necessarily, but are there things that you think you will bring to that position that are a little bit different because you're female? I have to correct you a little Sorry. because I'm a commander of the military academy. Sorry, the, okay. Uh, okay. I apologize. And, uh, and I've already started. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure how it will affect. That's really hard for me to answer because I'm there to do a job and I do not have the gender focus right, right. more than, uh, I shouldn't have it more than any other right. commander would have. Uh, I'm a commander of every cadet, which means I want to develop strong leaders regardless of gender. But it is important for me that our leaders are able to handle gender issues, both concerning women in the armed forces but also handling gender issues when it comes to operating in uh, Afghanistan or, or where elsewhere. Uh, so, so I don't know if they will see a big difference. I think it's important for some of the young female cadets to have a female role model. Mm -hmm. um, but, but my focus is doing my very best mm -hmm. to build a strong um, officer core for the future and not in particular right, dealing right. with these gender issues. Yeah, I just was curious about whether you 
thought because of because you're female and you interpret your experiences, we I think we interpret them differently than men do. Yeah. Um, whether that would have a whether there would be a difference mm. in how you would do the same job. Um, uh, you know, I've been a commander and, 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 and an officer for, uh, for a very long time in a very masculine society. Right. So it's hard for me to answer whether I <laughs> represent something entirely different yeah. than my male colleagues. I think other people who would have to answer that yeah. question. When that said, we, we need the, the diversity. And that's what's so good about the military system, that we have our leaders for a few years then there are other leaders coming in with other perspectives, and I'm sure I will contribute to bring other perspectives into the military academy, but, but I can't right. answer how much part of that is right. because I'm a right. woman or not. But probably some. Carol, good morning. Um, my name is Paul Tennant. I'm a British Army Exchange officer working in the Pentagon. Um, I'd like to ask you about uh, risk. It strikes me that um, uh, the closer one gets to the highest intensity combat, uh, the risk implicit in females being engaged in those activities increases. And some of the risks are, of course, outside the control of the female. It's not just a question of physical capabilities or indeed mental stability or emotional stability. It's as much to do with the fact that we can't always predict, we cannot predict how uh, some of your male counterparts might react, particularly in the most... Um, extreme of uh, intense combat experiences. Um, what I'm wondering is, have you personally had any uh, very intense combat experience uh, which you could draw on to give us the benefit of the lessons that you've extracted from those? And, and even if I could ask you to try and project beyond the limits of your own combat experience to anticipate some of those risks and perhaps give some guidance as to how one might head them off at the pass, so to speak. Mm. Uh that, that's a little hard to answer because I can talk about situations. We haven't had hard fighting over days and weeks, but I've been into very risky situation with firing or grenade shelling and so on, uh, which means I should be careful. And experience with one or two women, if that is, um, if, if we could generalize out from that. So from. From what I've seen, and also Norwegian forces, we've been operating in, in Lebanon since 78, and <laughs> Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan. So we've had some, uh, yeah, several women in, in the very tough situations. But, uh, but I think American and, and other forces have much more experience with, uh, with uh, fighting over time. So, so we have to be careful with uh, comparing. But from the situations I've seen, I haven't seen a big difference. And, and, and we have uh, yeah, women in different uh, positions. And we've also seen that from other branches um, in Afghanistan. We, as I was the commander, some, one of the units who had the most toughest situation was actually uh, at some time, the, the medical platoon, for some reason, they were shot at again and again and again. And they had, they had several women. Uh, so, so we didn't really see that that made a change to the morale. But I would be careful about uh, um, generalizing. And I think it's important to, to have research and, uh, and look at this. Uh, issues, of course, and we have limited research on this because the, the numbers are so small and, and there are more situations than fighting over time. Um, let me ask a little bit about uh, lodging and cohabitation and um, both in deployed environments and then back home in garrison and, um, and your experience with what kinds of distinctions you think might be important to make in those different kinds of environments? Facilities and yeah, such things, exactly. that's what you mean? Yeah, that's also a hot topic back home, or, or at least an issue we're dealing with. When we are in field, mm -hmm. both exercises and, uh, and operations, there aren't any differences. We sleep in the same tents. We do not have specific facilities for women or men. Uh, we're dealing well. What's discussed back home is whether we should, for the conscripts, 
um, have women and men sharing rooms, sharing, sharing facilities. Every, every unit has facilities where we can have uh, separation mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to hygiene and, and bedrooms and all this. But, but many of the girls feel that they are a little excluded from their platoon or unit as we separate them. And therefore, we have tried in specific units to have mixed rooms. Mm -hmm. And most of the girls, this is voluntary, but most do it. Mm -hmm. And most of the girls report very positively back on it. Mm -hmm. When that said, I, I am a little reluctant myself, and I did not allow mixed rooms in my own unit as a battalion. And that was mainly uh, several reasons. Uh, for instance, we tried to recruit immigrants. Mm -hmm. And would that be uh, OK for a Muslim woman or, or other cultures? Mm -hmm. I think we're, yeah. And, uh, and the other issues is that we, we do not have a lot of sexual harassment in the Norwegian army. But of course, that's also an issue that's coming up uh, now and then. And the, the issues I had in my units were usually from weekends where they were out drinking and partying, and you had some of these uh, uh, hard uh, cases. And I thought, if I had mixed rooms, that might be worse. Mm -hmm. But some of the girls will say, no, when you have mixed rooms, you are more like brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the male in the room will, will be more caretaking than, uh, than a threat. Mm -hmm. So, so I do not have the best answer, but um, uh, but I think some privacy is good uh, for both sexes when you are uh, in uh, on on post or basis. Um, well, not to be a little indelicate here, and all, um, but we have had a, a fair amount of research on, uh, particularly for females in deployed environments, health challenges for female health issues and lack of familiarity uh, for male medical officers and how necessarily to treat and prevent some female health problems downrange in deployed environments. And I'm just wondering, have you had issues like that, um, sort of female deployed medical problems? I, I can't think of specific female uh, okay. medical problems, no. And again, I apologize for the <laughs> uh, urinary tract infections and things like that, that women tend to get at higher rates when they're deployed than, than men do. And, and feeling uncomfortable going to talk to male medical officers or feeling like they don't get the appropriate treatment or things like that. Mm. Uh, but that's not been... No, it's not been a big mm. issue. And, and in our medical platoons, there are always women uh, women and men, which means they can always talk to, a f at least in the b bigger operations like, like Afghanistan, there is always a female nurse they can talk to if there, there are specific issues. Uh, um, or gender-related issues, I think. Okay. But. Sorry, we'll go here and there and then here. So, right here. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Captain Malay, I'm United States Marine Corps. I work at TBS. A uh, quick question for you. Uh, when you went through your infantry training as a platoon commander, what were the major challenges that you, f you saw, either in your subordinates trying to integrate a, a female, maybe for, for the first time, or through your peers? Just any challenges that you may have of face you can share with us? From, from integration? Specifically within your infantry. Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was opened up in 84 and, and I joined a few years later so, so I didn't see the very first one come in. But I've been the first one to a couple of units myself. And <clears throat> uh, of course there are always people questioning. So, so I, I felt a little bit myself and I've seen many of my sisters in arms that feel that you have to um, you have to do a little bit better, because if you do something that's not good as a female, it will um, be generalized for for all women. So you feel a responsibility for for the other women, and uh, um, and. 
I don't know if it should be like this, but, but I really felt that you, uh, since you, you, at least you think people are questioning whether you are able to do the job as good as a man, you will all the time feel a little bit of pressure to um, convince that you're, um, you have the right background or, or is, um, have the capabilities. So I, I think that's uh, the, the main uh, challenge for most women being the first ones or, or one of the few. Are, do you think there are ways to alleviate some of that pressure or is it just that's just the way it is? I think this is very much about leadership again. I think you have to have strong leaders who see their subordinates and, uh, and uh, are supportive and that, that's not only uh, regarding the women, it's the same with male. That uh, they um, they uh, support in the way they talk about you. That when there are rumors, they are hard at this, and that they build strong cohesion. Talk a lot about what does it mean within a unit, uh, and the importance about strong cohesion. Uh, that that will uh, better the situation for uh, for the women, but I also think that yeah you have you have the questions about critical mass, right. and and it in particular as an enlisted I think it's quite tough being the single one. Mm -hmm. I uh, I think that's easier for me as an officer because you have the respect for for your ranks and and I know my peers respect me because they've been through the same training and the same academies and so on. But for an enlisted coming from the civilian society into this quite masculine environment, that can be quite hard. And therefore, it's an advantage if at least you have a few women together so they feel uh, that they have someone to talk to or discuss to if, if, they, uh, if there are issues. Okay. Uh, I think there was a question in the middle. Go ahead, right there. Good morning. Sorry. Good morning. I'm Kelsey Campbell. I'm from the Office of Secretary of Defense. And my question is on the support of the population, because any major policy change, you have to have the population on board. And I see that Norway consistently ranks very high on the Global Gender Equality Index. America's down in the mid to late 20s. Um, so I was wondering if you had any advice for U.S. policymakers, NGOs, advocacy groups to communicate to the population the importance of diversity and inclusion as a helping our operational success, not just something that opens opportunity, but it's vital for the mission. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, I, th I think that the, the leaders must be clear here because it's, it's, you're right about the Norwegian society. I also, I also mentioned in the beginning, it is a very, very egalitarian society. And for many years we have had, for instance, in our government, approximately half of them have been women. We have had five uh, female secretary of defense. So, so we have very many top, uh, top leaders, both in business but also in, uh, in public uh, affairs. And, and those are role models. And I think they make it easier for us within the military or in another organization um, to, to be appreciated and to see these advantages. But these military leaders have been very, no, those political leaders have been very clear continuously about uh, the importance of, um, uh, of uh, increasing the numbers of, uh, of women. When it comes to the military <coughs> leaders, there has been a change throughout the years I've been in the service. Because in the very beginning, I, I had the impression that they were always talking about the importance of women for, for the welfare of the unit or for the, uh, for the morale and such things. But for, these days... The for social good? For social good, yeah. Uh, that's at least what we felt, and I think that was expressed uh, <coughs> now and then. But, but the leaders I see today, both at top level and, and also throughout the ranks, uh, see more of the advantage of <coughs> diversity to build innovative, innovative organizations. They see it from the operations. If you're going to deal with the population in Afghanistan or <coughs> elsewhere, you, you have to have women to communicate. And, um, 
and I know also other reasons. So, uh, so I think we've seen a change there. And I, I think part of the reason is that we have seen that women actually contribute we, um, to, to um, operational effectiveness. But I, I wouldn't take it too far. And uh, I, I would be careful with talking about the specific shares because I think more important than increasing number of women is the way you build your leaders. Again, regardless of gender. If you have male leaders who are, uh, yeah, have this values uh, and uh, integrity, they, uh, that they can also very well handle lots of, or, or make sure we have uh, uh, strong, good units. Okay, I think there was a question over here in the middle. Oh, here we go, right here. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, General. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. My name is Rosemary Segir. I'm a nonprofit organization, though my late husband was a USA Marine. Oh. My question is, how do you deal with the women and the, the military who come out of the combat or the military out of uh, uh, the military? What is your system? Do you follow up with them? Do they get jobs or... How do they live after leaving the military? Or they are just there, out there as civilians, and no attention as people who served your country, as those who served our country here in the United States. I'm trying to build a take care for the elderly veterans who served the, mm -hmm. the country, where they can come, sit, relax, and meet each other for network. What is your system in Norway looking at? And what can you tell the world women uh, who are in military like you uh, how to move on with life after military or in the military, thank you. Yeah, he, here we have totally different systems. And when it comes to handling veterans, I think we have a lot to learn, to learn from the US because we are working very hard to, uh, to be better at handling our uh, veterans or those who have served. Um, for many years, we always focused on our Second World War veterans. But I think we, we partly forgot all the veterans from, uh, uh, from our time. Now this is changing. We have built up uh, veteran affairs. We have our, one of our top generals who's been head of this uh, and really made both the civilian and the military society much better at focusing on it. But we have still a long way to go. So uh, I'm glad you, you <laughs> brought this up because this is uh, so important um, for our society and also to recruit for the military to see that we take care of our, uh, our veterans as they uh, leave the force. Uh, I think we have time for one, one more question. We'll make this the last one. Hey, morning, Ingrid. Um, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Miller. I'm from the Marine Corps. Um, we went to the Army War College together, so this is kind of a reattack. <laughs> one question I have with your conscription force: one, are women required to serve? Because in the in the United States, selective service, it's not. And two, do you allow reclassification? Like you said, a woman gets pregnant, she's finished, she decides she doesn't no longer want to be in the infantry. Is that part of the flexibility that the Norwegian system provides for? And is that able to be transferred to the male as well? Can a male soldier decide to get out of the infantry if he doesn't like it anymore? Mm. Yeah, first conscription. We, we've had conscriptions uh, yeah, for very many years in the Second World War, uh, but we opened female conscription this year. So we hardly have any experience. It was strong political support to, um, to have conscription for women and uh, but we, we do not need uh, the numbers. Only one third of our male population do their service due to what we need. And when we now will have the women as well, we are actually curious how many are motivated. And because it's a luxury problem, we can really pick the very best. And it's, it's still very popular to serve, which means uh, uh, that we have a very good mass of uh, on, on conscripts. So, Can I so, ask a quick question about yeah. that? Um, 
because you recruit some from your conscript population, mm. was the opening of conscription to females also intended to broaden the female recruiting pool to yes. some extent? Yes, absolutely. Because a few years ago, we said that the women has to come in for a day to get information. Because I think that's the main challenge in recruiting more women to the armed forces, that they, they don't know it. Exposure. Yeah, they don't know their opportunities. So we worked hard to inform more, and, um, and conscription will contribute to at least they start reflecting on maybe this is something for me and maybe a military career is good. But it's also, it's also a matter of uh, same opportunities, but also same obligations in a society. We have lots of advantages as, as uh, women in Norway, but then we also t have to, to take the hardship. And, uh, so, so that's part of it. When it comes to pregnancy and change of branches, we very seldom see uh, officer or enlisted change branches. It is possible, but, uh, but we don't have many who do. Because there are always staff positions or office positions within every <laughs> branch, so I haven't heard that as a big issue. But, but it is an important question because we lose very many, of, um, in particular women, but, but also men as they get to the point where they uh, set, uh, have children and, uh, and establish families. Well, Carol Gidget, thank you so much for sharing your time with us, for your service, and for your inspiration. Um, we very much appreciate it. We, we thank, thank you for uh, coming and helping to educate us as we make our way forward in this area, and we hope to continue the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>